in the heart of East Africa lies Uganda, a nation with a complex history of political upheaval and social transformation. From the colonial era to the present day, the struggle for civic space and civil liberties has been a defining feature of Uganda's journey towards democracy. Before gaining independence in 1962, Uganda's civic space was heavily restricted under British colonial rule. The colonial administration controlled and regulated civic activities, curtailing freedoms of speech, assembly and association for the local population. Despite these limitations, pockets of civic engagement and resistance against colonial oppression emerged, laying the groundwork for Uganda's eventual independence movement. Key figures like Kabaka Mutesa II and nationalist leaders advocated for increased political autonomy and the end of British rule, setting the stage for Uganda's independent struggle. Organizations such as the Uganda National Congress UNC, and later the Uganda People's Congress UPC, and Democratic Party DP, emerged as political vehicles for advocating for self-governance and democratic principles. The demand for independence um, was laid by Sir Edward Mutesa in the period that Sir uh, Andrew Cohen was governor here. Says Colonial Secretary Oliver Littleton, violates an agreement signed by the Kabaka, who is now the center of a parliamentary controversy. He demanded for dates for independence. He demanded, you know, for, 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 for the termination of the 1900 agreement. And for that reason, he was uh, in, deposed and, and deported to, to the UK in 1955. Following independence, Uganda experienced significant challenges regarding civic space and civil liberties, particularly during the tenure of Milton Obote's first government. Despite initial promises of democracy, Obote's regime increasingly consolidated power, leading to increased authoritarianism and a crackdown on political opposition and dissent. The introduction of a new constitution in 1967 centralized power in the hands of the president leading to the suppression of opposition parties and the restriction of civil liberties. Reports of human rights abuses, censorship and political repression became commonplace as Obote's government sought to maintain control. During the regime of Idi Amin from 1971 to 1979, Uganda's civic space and civil liberties faced even greater restrictions. Amin's rule was characterized by authoritarianism, brutality, and widespread human rights abuses, leading to one of the darkest periods in Uganda's history. Idi Amin's authoritarianism was naked. There was no pretense that he was an authoritarian or a dictator and he cracked down on civil society in many ways than one, especially civil society that got involved, that was supposed to get involved in politics, in the political contestations. He cracked down on the media, and there was no actual independent media. He cracked down on intellectuals. He interfered with universities and even the syllabus. Freedom of expression, assembly and association virtually disappeared as Amin's government used state-sponsored violence to maintain control and suppress dissent. The expulsion of Uganda's Asian minority and mass atrocities against specific ethnic groups further exacerbated the climate of fear and repression. I want to see that the whole Kampala street is not full of Indians. I think they will be sitting like they are sitting on the fire. I will tell you this. You just wait after three months. What will you do to them? Okay, you will see. <laughs> you, you said you wanted you, you can I think it. they will not sit comfortable here in Uganda. I will tell you this. I must actually tell you the truth. Following Amin's ousting in 1979, Uganda entered a period of transition characterized by political instability and efforts to rebuild the country. The post Amin era initially saw improvements in civic space compared to the oppressive atmosphere under Amin's rule. However, challenges persisted as Uganda grappled with political turbulence and intermittent conflicts. The 1980s witnessed a return to constitutional rule under Milton Obote's presidency, but political repression and human rights abuses continued to affect civic space in the country. <laughs> The 
the drafting and eventual promulgation of the 1995 constitution marked a significant milestone for Uganda, aiming to establish a framework for democratic governance and protect fundamental rights and freedoms. However, challenges to civic space persisted in subsequent years as Uganda navigated its path towards democracy as Godba Tomoshabe, the executive director of the Great Lakes Institute for Strategic Studies, explains. Since about 2005, there has been a very significant erosion of civic space in this country. Uh, because from that time, what you have is President Museveni's regime uh, shift into a regime survival mode. And therefore, it's not surprising that when you, if you reflect backwards from 2005, you see the emergence of so many pieces of legislation that actually are designed to reduce the space uh, within which citizens have to engage in public policy, engage in politics. Godba says citizens remain powerless in a country ruled by the power of guns. All, all our power as citizens has been taken away by the use of guns and by use of money. During the NAM summit, we are aware that there were trucks parked in front of Dr. Kiza Besige's house. There were trucks parked in front of Bobby Wine's house. And you see here is a thing. What was the worst that could happen? Dr. Miriam Atembe was one of the members of the Constituent Assembly that drafted the current constitution. I had finished studying law in 1975. Finishing my law did not help me because the political environment was completely unconducive. Historically, Civic space in Uganda had been shrunk to a near zero for women. While making the 1995 constitution, Matembe led the push for women to be more included in all aspects of Uganda's social and political systems as equals to men. I went on the political platform to shout for the girl, child and women. They were treated as secondary class citizens. Peri Aritua has since picked up from Dr. Matembe. Aritua's work involves getting more women involved in leadership positions and training them to become top leaders. We believe that when women showcase good leadership, it opens doors for other women. Former leader of the opposition, Winnie Kiza, reveals that the civic space is not any wider for those like her in politics. Parliament is a place where ideas must flow freely, that must, people must exchange their ideas. People must speak on behalf of those who cannot be able to come to parliament to represent their constituents. It's not as easy as people think. I participated in a session where parliament was attacked by the military. It was at a time when a motion was being tabled to amend the constitution to remove the age limit the president at that time was 73 years. Meaning that if the age limit had been retained, then he was not going to contest again. And it was at that time that we saw a place that is supposed to be a place of ideas, a place where people come to talk that the talking was curtailed by the special forces camp, an army that is known to be a, a unit that protects the president. MPs were beaten, parliament was made a battlefield. Up to now, some MPs are still nursing wounds. They are still nursing injuries. So we really see that from time to time, we realize that Uganda is running away from a democracy to a dictatorship. When it happened to the judiciary in 2005, by the attack of the judiciary by the black members, people thought it was an issue of the judiciary, and we never made alarm. When he came to parliament, people are thinking it is the parliament. Before we could know it, we saw the society being attacked as well. 
Peter Mangela runs a non-profit in the governance space. He now lives in constant fear over his personal security. We have had um, drones showing up at my home in the middle of the night. Yeah, so the challenges are many. And these challenges, of course, have made a number of our friends either run into exile, um, uh, disappear, you know, yeah. The, the state of civic space. The little that was there has um, nearly disappeared. Civic space has also been shrunk through legal systems. We have, right now as an NGO, you might have, I think, like, 50 things to fulfill, like 20 laws to, to follow before you can even open office. Usually we apply for five-year permit, but increasingly we have seen that when you apply for a five-year permit, when you work on governance, they will give you two-year permit with no explanation. You know? So that's restrictive because if, for instance, you're dealing with a cohort of leaders who have been elected for a five-year term, you don't want the interruption. And then there's a lot of delays in the process of renewal. The NGOs have reported being visited by people. Uh, they say, oh, did they identify themselves? They say, OK, we are, we are from uh, uh, NGO Bureau. And oftentimes, when we check with the NGO Bureau, they say, no. We, when we send our staff, they would be clearly uh, identifiable. Uh, sometimes they also know we are from, uh, from the DISO's office or we are from the other DC's office. And sometimes they may just fail to introduce themselves. And that in itself creates a situation where the NGOs are living in fear and they are you know, starting to censor their, themselves. Not to forget that there are NGOs that have organized meetings and some of these meetings have been stopped either by you know, the district security apparatus or you know, people who claim to be from the RDC's office. And that, in a way, that entire uh, uh, discussion or happening is what constitutes the shrinking civic space. Uh, we've had two lawyers serving prison term for criticizing judges. So you see how the anger has moved from ordinary citizens to the judiciary, which should be protecting things. Now, civic space depends on those freedoms, your ability to speak. And if you can speak, then you'll have your civic space, irrespective of whether I like what you say or I don't. Oftentimes, it is the executive that has been accused of trampling civic space, but even the courts of law where civil society would ordinarily go for redress are now cited as participants in shrinking civic space further. Uh, today, for example, NGOs cannot come together into an association. That was banned. And the High Court said that's okay. Uh, that's the new EU case where NGOs used to work through what they call coalitions. That is five, ten NGOs come together and say for us we are advocating for this and they start advocating. It's not there. And it has moved even to charitable events. Growing up, people used to have charity walk to fundraise for things. Now they are so doubtful if they can do a charity walk to, do a, to fundraise money to build a, a hospital. At the international level, the one uh, terror brought us all these other things. Uh, and that's why it gave us excuses. That's why. If you spoke civic space, people will say, yeah, even the Americans have done this. Of course, self-censorship is pushed by fear and intimidation. The end result has been everyone has sort of withdrawn. There are people who don't think that this civic space is their business until it's a bit late. Many other people right now, they're okay with the status quo until that time. Some of the offices were closed. In 2021, President Museveni suspended the Democratic Governance Facility, DGF, a European basket fund aimed at providing financial support to NGOs, demanding that government get a seat on DGF's board. In 2023, DGF exited Uganda, rendering hundreds of NGOs powerless without their main funding partner. Many NGOs have had their bank accounts frozen, offices broken into, and some even closed down. 
Most of these have been those working in the governance advocacy sector. Some individuals were detained in unknown prisons, were tortured, and a lot of mayhem was caused to individuals who still thought that they would use their civic space to advocate for certain issues in our society. NGO Forum Executive Director Moses Isova agrees with Kiza, adding that even the public spaces previously used for mobilization of the masses are no more. Now what we've actually seen in the past couple of years is that the subject of shrinking space has perhaps mutated, has a bit changed or morphed, so to say. Uh, previously, we simply talked about oper you know, NGO operational space. You know, we talked about shrinking civic space because uh, security agencies could come and break into offices uh, or people that, you know, were assumed to be security agencies because they dressed like security agencies. Uh, and so, you know, we would break into uh, offices. And we've actually raised this up with the, with the Minister of Internal Affairs. But the, the change that we see now around this, you know, this rinking civic space is that if right now we see physical space, which is also shrinking. Growing up, I knew that we went to the Kololo airstrip, we played football there, and you see that there is right now a, a military or security presence in those, in those spaces. And if you go uh, around Kampala, around the city, all the, all the roundabouts that leading to the city Oftentimes, you'll find uh, security presence in this in this uh, in this roundabout, and that is what I call that uh, the, the 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 aspect of the concept of shrinking civic space has actually moved just from narrowing down operational space of civil society organizations to now physical spaces being narrowed down. However, challenges to civic space have persisted long after 1995 and are still present to this day. According to Dr. Fred Mohumuza, the issue of shrinking civic space extends to economic rights. We are still seeing people struggling to live, even crossing over uh, infant mortality, child mortality, those early years. And some of them are directly linked to access to these economic rights. The moment a civil society comes out to fight, it means there is an injustice. Now, whoever created that injustice is not going to be happy, would want to fight back. So most of the spaces where people have pushed civil society for economic rights, they have not been free spaces. They have had to push to get the space. Dr. Sara Bilete says the media is most at risk with this shrinking space. The most affected categories of people by the shrinking civic space are journalists, activists, artists, and political actors, mainly in the opposition. But we have laws that, like the Uganda Communication Act 2013 that is trying to control how people must express themselves. Investigative journalist Solomon Seranja says self-censorship is now the norm as people in positions of power clamp down on the media. The editors, even after they have cross-checked the story, they think thrice about whether they should publish this story. And that self-censorship is the biggest threat to media freedom in Uganda. The fact that editors have to triple guess themselves of if we put this story on the front page or if we put it as story number one, what will happen to us? We've seen media houses closed in the past. So there's always those decisions that are made, sometimes at a strategic level, to drop impactful stories that would have uh, caused social change or exposes that would have been so big, but because of the threats that come from external factors, including those from the state, the media then begins to second guess itself and not truly reflect what really society is. When you have institutions that are supposed to support the media to grow, exerting external pressure to defend the regime or to protect the regime or protect the, the audience from knowing what the regime is doing, then you, get, you start to get scared. The most recent violation of, of media freedoms in this country was an attempt to suspend 39 media bosses for having covered live a procession of Bob Wine as he, as he left his home to appear to, to, to respond to police summons. 
the then executive director of Uganda Communications Commission attempted to suspend the media bosses in several media houses in Uganda. This is just an example of the several acts that happen in this country that violate people's fundamental rights and freedoms. Some journalists have opted to continue their work from elsewhere. Mordecai Morisa now does his art and journalism from exile in the United States. He says the civic space in Uganda had become too small for him. 2020, you yeah. called out for seven years. Yes. I'm like, you can't keep quiet. And I posted this video on social media. I'm like, you can't keep quiet. This is extremely wrong. Mm. And after a few days, then I started receiving calls. Delete the video. Uh, calls from who? I don't know these guys. Some of them were sending messages on my phone. What do you think you are? Delete the video. The music and art sector has also seen its fair share of activism and advocacy. They've used art to exercise their rights in the civic space, writing songs and plays about a wide range of issues in society. John Segawa is an actor and film director. One of his plays, The State of the Nation, was blocked from being performed. When they banned our play, State of the Nation, at the National Theatre, the first contact was Mama Wavana, Mariam. Uh, she calls me late in the night. And she asks me, what is your goal? What, what do you want to accomplish when you oppose government? You have seen people doing opposing government, and they are not here to, to take care of their kids. Yeah? And the, the person we are seeing of Pobera call was Byron Coward or the late, because he was doing the same stuff, theater and whatever. Where is Biden Coward? Where is he buried? Have you heard about his kids? Those are the, those were the questions of Marion. Segawa says the system is rigged to push artists into a mold, something that he has resisted. They have offered upcoming uh, film directors and writers money to come up with several projects. If you want funding, then you must be part of the system. Good actors are intimidated. Good writers are intimidated. Uh, good producers are intimidated, okay? And we are being forced to do one kind of storytelling. All the artists agree on one thing, their fight for copyright laws in Uganda. <laughs> Dr. Hildeman is one of the top musicians in Uganda. Nowadays, however, he spends his time making laws, and top on his agenda is creating a stronger copyright law. Most of the creatives don't earn from their uh, creatives, which is a big challenge. And uh, we thought it is the copyright law that can uh, help to improve the status of the industry as we talk. Currently, government is adamant about uh, providing for an administrati uh, administrative body for copyright. And this has made enforcement and copyright administration very complicated. Number one effect is it has made creatives very poor. So we are poor. We are moving poor billionaires. But surprisingly, when it comes to art, they are so mindful about how artists are going to behave when they become rich. Today, the artist is part of the political ecosystem. And every decision that affects, or every decision that empowers the artist must undergo a tightly knit political sieve. The writing on the wall is clear that government wants to control the sector. <laughs> As the civic space shrinks further, a new law is now threatening the very existence of the arts industry. The stage plays and public entertainment rules of 2019 uh, prescribe many permits and licenses for the artist. They require a certificate of censorship. They require approval from local government. And the effect of this is that it creates many layers of financial burden on the artist. And um, 
uh, this abuses the freedom of expression as enshrined in Article 40 of the Constitution. Also, the UCC uh, film documentaries, uh, commercial still photography regulations of 2019, which requires makers of film and documentaries and all uh, to provide uh, a description of every scene, to provide an English translation of whatever they have created, to attach a budget showing how much they're going to be paying an actor, a technician, or another professional. These rules also require a person to show uh, proof of cap financial capacity. Uh, sometimes a person may be required to provide a bank guarantee or bond. Generally, uh, these are beyond what is acceptable in a free and democratic uh, society. Artistic expression should not be a preserve of the rich. The Uganda Medical Association is a glowing example of civil society resilience and achievement in a hostile environment. We are the weak health sector with a very weak human capital in terms of numbers, uh, but mostly um, motivation to work and then the equipment to use. Amidst intimidation and threats, the doctors persevered pushing back against the state's intimidation. The health sector now enjoys the fruits of the Uganda Medical Association's civil advocacy. There was something called the Health Monitoring Unit, which was notorious in harassing and, of course, arresting frontline medical professionals who are not enough. So the problem was they did not have the competence to make that uh, assessment, uh, contrary to what was provided in the law. So we consulted widely with the Kenya Medical Association and the Kenya uh, Medical and Dental Practitioners Union. We also cons co consulted widely with Uganda, uh, with the McKay University Academy Staff Association uh, to really give us guidance. But we had the support, most of all, of lawyers, the Law Society, the, the, the health, uh, health and Law Cluster, Chapter 4, uh, Center for Health, Human Rights and Development, they offered their legal support. They were here to give us guidance and give us protection. But also we followed international guidelines on how to express our labor-related concerns as guided by the declaration of the World Medical Association of Tokyo, where, uh, you know, physicians may participate in industrial action in an ethical way. When it comes to such things and we push, we negotiate and we see things are not moving, we hold meetings. The members say, okay, if we cannot sit on one table and agree, let us go for industrial, industrial action. Uh, when it comes to issues of uh, increasing the salaries for health workers, it has worked. To, to a great extent, the doctor of today is more aware of their rights, but also responsibilities. We still have major challenges with drug delivery and a national health insurance scheme is long overdue. The NGO Forum, together with other civil society actors, are now engaging with relevant government agencies to try and remedy the challenges faced by NGOs in Uganda. Whereas the situation looks dire for civil society in Uganda now, NGO Forum Executive Director Moses Isova is optimistic that civil society will survive and will never totally disappear. I want to be optimistic and I don't think civil society can be wished away. Uh, I think for as long as you have citizens in the country and every country will have citizens, these citizens will mobilize themselves. They will mobilize either for political interest, they will mobilize under what we call the political society, which are the political parties, or they will mobilize themselves under civil society organizations to be able to see how they can address aspects that affect their social indicators. Civil society organizations should never be seen in bad light. That civil society organizations need to be seen as, you know, uh, working with government. Uh, just by the, 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 by the name, we are non-governmental organizations. And by non-governmental organizations, we are by and large supporting uh, government. And the law is, is, should not be weaponized 
against civil society organizations. Because when you create a law that we is weaponized against civil society organizations, it would be like you're creating a law that is weaponized against the private sector. If you do that, you are putting a toothpick on your own eye, and you shouldn't. We suffer the, the issue of narrowing the operational space. For civil society organizations in Uganda now, advocacy on governance is a no-go zone. Those in other sectors, although heavily restricted, are still tolerated. But the many NGOs that are in their governance area, in governance and democracy influencing areas that would be asking questions uh, of, of, of public expenditure, those kind of organizations, oftentimes their operational space is, is reduced. They are more under the critical eye. They are seen to be asking questions that they shouldn't be asking. And therefore, those are the organizations that are facing this shrinking civic space.